I tell lies when it suits me. <laughs> Today we're going to talk about Jimmy Savile. Greg, why don't you tell us about the videos we're going to watch? So the video is from a thing called Is This Your Life? After he had done a This Is Your Life show, and the interviewer is Andrew Neal. And I think Mark can better describe what this is. Yeah, Jimmy Savile was Sir James Savile, uh, OBE, a national treasure at one point, was a prolific presenter, raised money for charities, uh, was one of our biggest serial offenders ever in the UK, a complete monster. Being a DJ, of course, didn't just bring you fame, it brought you girls, lots of girls. Did it? Well, I think it did. Well, Goodbye. You nice said it did. You. We spoke Goodbye. to a long-time friend of yours. Did you? Who knows about these things. Oh. Bunny Lewis. Oh, Here yes. he is. Yes. There was a funny little hotel tucked away up, not that far from Tottenham Court Road, um, where Jim used to go. Whereas other disc jockeys, which he was at the time, um, used to go to quite smart um, hostelries around the town, Jim would go to this very small one where he'd have his bicycle tethered at the back, whether that was for a quick getaway or not, I'm not sure. And um, um, we'd sometimes have a bit of fun around there if we'd been involved in a program together or something like that. And uh, we had a few friends there because a lot of other artists are there. And um, one in particular, Jim might remember, called Norma. I don't know whether you'd like to ask him about her. Well, Sir Jim, I think I would like to ask you about Norma. Tell us. I don't mind getting Bunny off the hook because he's married. <laughs> now, then his, his girlfriend was called Norma. <laughs> And he has now fixed it for me to get him off the hook with his missus. <laughs> so me being single and a few bob in the building society. Yes, Norma, a lovely girl. I'm the faintest idea who she was. So you don't remember <laughs> Norma? Of course, like it was yesterday. And it wasn't Bunny's girl at all. He has never been unfaithful in his entire life. It was me. <laughs> uh, it was me who was beastly with what, what do they call her again? Norma. Norma, Norma, yes. Maybe I was... there were too many, Jimmy, to remember. Eh? Maybe there were too many. Yes, well, no man need be ashamed of his working clothes. And I've you gone kept through... your clothes on. Well, I've gone through life being a sex symbol, and... <laughs> She's laughing. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so what you're going to see, I think, throughout this is really a vaudeville act, a a, a big, uh, let's say, buffoon, an exaggeration of, of a human being. Why is this? Because we have somebody here that we know is hiding in plain sight. This person has uh, abused more people uh, than anybody else that we understand in British history, but also was one of the UK's most important entertainers and raisers of money for charity, um, uh, had audiences with the Pope, with uh, the Queen, uh, with Prince Charles, uh, visited the Prime Minister at Christmas. This is somebody who managed to get themselves at the heart of British society and at the same time commit some uh, atrocities. I'll talk about that more throughout. But what do we have here? Just a massive act in front of Neil, uh, Andrew Neil here, who's the editor or was the editor of the Sunday Times, so should be a very strong uh, interviewer. Well, he's got he's brought up Bunny Lewis here as a as a character reference here. Uh, Bunny Lewis, uh, record producer, um, drag act in the nineteen seventies. Um, it's clearly making, I think, Jimmy a little bit uneasy, but still super casual. Look at the the bent wrist there, just kind of lots of bends in the wrist. You know, somebody who's wanting to be really active, they'll have lots of uh, energy going through their, their wrist. Him, bent wrist there, super casual, an effete pose, I would say, with that break at the wrist. Uh, here's what we're going to see throughout, that he will deny things, attack other people, and then reverse the victim and offender. I can talk about this uh, a little more later on, but he does that most interestingly through sarcasm and going in the opposite direction. So instead of, of denying any act, what he'll do is play the act 
even harder. Say that he does do that at an extreme. Just be an exaggeration throughout. Uh, there, I hope that's a nice kind of start bookend at this. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? Mark, we're, we're going to say the same things because this guy uses sarcasm and that ha, 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 making something ridiculous to farce, takes it to farce as a way of gaslighting, as a way mm -hmm. of taking it to less, to, make, to mean less. Mm -hmm. Funny, I also have on my notes, the fool. He's the fool. That's the way he plays this is it's his character. And that fool, we love a fool. And if you think of medieval times, they used the fool as a way to entertain people because they're not dangerous. When a fool is dangerous, they're terrifying because now they can go anywhere they want because everybody trusts them. That sarcastic laugh he has used over and over and over. And what he does is insulate himself by pulling the audience to him and protecting himself with the audience. Watch when he does this. In this case, it's not a big deal. He's a womanizer. Nobody's in the days they're talking about. This is the 1950s, probably. There's not such a big deal. So he's not got a lot to hide. But wait until he gets further in and we see him do that. In here, as the guy starts to, to talk, his internal voice is prepping for response. And by internal voice, I mean looking left, looking left, looking left, down. And then this is one upmanship between guys. He thinks of a way to turn it back against him. When I was in high school, I had a chemistry teacher and a, uh, I think it was geography teacher who had gone to high school together. And one of them told me the other one dated a girl called Booger Sleeves. And for obvious reasons, Booger Sleeves. And the guy said he's only jealous because he married her. You know, it was one of those back and forth one upmanships. And that's kind of the same thing here. So if you play with this, this is just a person doing their usual thing. But the other thing that we're talking about here is this is the organism does what made the organism successful. He can hide in plain sight because the audience expects the Jimmy Savile that is the fool. Scott, what do you got? All right. Yeah, you guys are nailing it. it this is an act. And every time he, that the, um, the the interviewer zeroes in on something, he blows it up really big to make it go away. It makes it so big it literally pops and dissipates. So that's his that's his plan of of, of defense in the situation. Um, we see a huge uh, seating adjustment when he starts zeroing in on that stuff as well. He starts talking about who the guy is, that type of thing. And then when he says, uh, "I've got a big blink rate spike here somewhere." Um, I've changed to this notebook instead of having them up here where I can read them on the screen. So it's getting, it's tougher to do. Um, well, I can't find that part anyway. So, uh, he turtles, we see him turtling as well. We're seeing all kinds of stuff in here. It's really, uh, a great group of examples of seeing body language, but after a while it just sort of gets old because he's doing this, this show on the da 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 every time it happens. So he's, he's defending himself by blowing stuff up and making it almost so it's not real. He's almost blowing this guy's off, this this guy off. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, y'all y'all hit a bunch here. But two things I want you to pay attention to as we're going through this and throughout the rest of your life. Uh when you interact with another person, what are their defense mechanisms made of? And what are their stress responses or their mask made of? Like the image they present to the world. And masks are usually made up of the opposite of whatever that person might be trying to hide, which is typically guilt or shame is what the mask is uh, put on there for. Uh, I, as of watching this this morning, I had no idea who this was. Never heard of him. Uh, so obviously I thought grandiosity was here. He's extremely uncomfortable with the topic the moment that the video starts playing on the screen and the, 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 the topic comes up. A lot of his behavior is accentuated with this chin thrust and he's just bringing his chin up regularly, which is what uh, people do to is issue a challenge, show that we're not afraid of somebody exposing these vital organs here. And he uses this line about working clothes. I think, to potentially imply that his status might make the behavior acceptable and justified. Uh, it, with no idea who he is, my notes just say uh, authority and control, uh, status and power obsession, sexual shame and grandiosity, and that's with no idea. Uh, I did Google him halfway through video, too, because it was so ridiculous. That's all I got. <laughs> Are you, are, I do I not understand what you're saying. Did you say status? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> status. You mean, you mean status. One of those tape replays. 
Being a DJ, of course, didn't just bring you fame, it brought you girls. Lots of girls. Did it? Well, I think it did. Well, Goodbye. It, you said nice it did. You. We spoke Goodbye. to a long-time friend of yours. Did you? Who knows about these things. Oh. Bunny Lewis. Oh, Here yes. he is. Yes. There was a funny little hotel tucked away up, not that far from Tottenham Court Road, um, where Jim used to go. Whereas other disc jockeys, which he was at the time, um, used to go to quite smart um, hostelries around the town, Jim would go to this very small one where he'd have his bicycle tethered at the back, whether that was for a quick getaway or not, I'm not sure. And um, um, we'd sometimes have a bit of fun around there if we'd been involved in a program together or something like that. And uh, we had a few friends there because a lot of other artists are there. And um, one in particular, Jim might remember, called Norma. I don't know whether you'd like to ask him about her. Well, Sir Jim, I think I would like to ask you about Norma. Tell us. I don't mind getting Bunny off the hook because he's married. <laughs> now, then his, his girlfriend was called Norma. <laughs> And he has now fixed it for me to get him off the hook with his missus. <laughs> so, me being single and a few bob in the building society, yes, Norma, a lovely girl. I haven't the faintest idea who she was. So, you don't remember <laughs> Norma? Of course, like it was yesterday, and it wasn't Bonnie's girl at all. He has never been unfaithful in his entire life. It was me, uh, it was me who was beastly with, what, what do they call her again? Norma. Norma, Norma, yes. Maybe there were too many, Jimmy, to remember. Eh? Maybe there were too many. Yes, well, no man need be ashamed of his working clothes. And I've you gone kept through, your clothes on. Well, I've gone through life being a sex symbol, and... <laughs> she's laughing. He's always had a knife for the ladies. Um, young ones as well. I say young, I mean, you know, the proper age, 16 upwards. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he's always had one. His philosophy he would never get married because I don't think he could stick with a person more than three days. And I don't think he can still stick it with anybody more than three days. Is he right? When it comes to women, you've got a short attention span? No, women know too much. I'm all for girls that don't know too much. It's a different class, you see. Uh, <laughs> When you are single, it's because of some reason that you like being single. Uh, uh, Jesus didn't find any problem with it. I don't find any problem with it. Uh, a lot of the time, <laughs> people say, what? You're still single? You never got married? Why didn't you get married? The answer is, I have the faintest idea. But we don't, don't believe know. that J Jesus was quite a ladies' man, though you are, or have said you were. No, no, no. He, he used to knock about with the ladies. It says so in the book. He went in the, the, the Ucky house. He was talking to them in the Ucky house. Uh, but you so get, he, was, you, he was ducking and diving. So you were like him too? You were no, doing the same I'm not thing. like him at all. I was just saying, another famous person. He's a famous person. He was singing. It's good enough for him. It's good enough for me. But do you get bored after three days with the same no, female company no, as uh, I, your I, friend I, was saying? I'd stay with them for the rest of the They get bored with me. I'm a very boring fella. But if they get bored with you or you get bored with them or whatever... Mm. We're talking about a life, are we, in the 60s and 70s of lots of lovers, lots of female company? Oh, that's a long time ago. I've forgotten now. <laughs> you can't remember how many? No, the marks. Are there any marks there? I don't know. No, they've healed rather they're well. They've healed. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. have you had lots of female I would hope so, because being alive a long time, I would have hoped that one would have had lots and lots of them. But, uh, but do I've you got remember? This terrible oh, unfortunately, no, you see. I've got this. And anyway, I'm not, I never have been a grass. And a gentleman never grasses on ladies as ever. But we're not asking for names, we're oh, just asking for the general principle. Oh, so I mean... We just I mean, want to know if you live this sort well, of playboy say, life of the DJ. Yeah, give or take a, a few nice ladies. <laughs> but I mean, you know, you, uh, a gentleman doesn't ever speak of ladies. I, mean, I don't know where you come from. I mean, I don't know what your circles are, but my circle, ladies, are uh, very... You don't grass on them. No. All my mother ever told me was not to eat while I was talking, but that was another issue. Um, Bananas weren't around in those days. <laughs> All right, Greg, what do you got?
Yeah, let me just start by saying times are different. And, you know, 16 years old is the age of consent, I believe, in, in the UK. But times are different. People used to have marry when they were very young, and these are older men. So maybe there's something odd about this or not odd about this for them, but it's odd when a person starts off and corrects their statement about you liking young ones and moves it to statutory age of consent. That should make you have an immediate odd impression of this person when one of his friends says that. Then when the guy talks about three days as the longest he would be with them, we do see something interesting. We see a real Duchenne smile with zygomatic muscles and obic uh, the obicularis muscles and a smooth forehead when he's talking about three days. And he does kind of a I can't believe he remembered that. So he probably did say that. I can't stick with anybody more than three days. But then there's surprise in his face, which probably is like, I'm surprised he remembers this. One of the weird, the, the ones here that makes me not trust this guy and really believe all this happened is when he says something about women knew too much, I'm for girls. There's no humor in his face when he does this. What we're going to find is the fool and the humor is a way of, of pushing things away. He doesn't hear. Is this a confession? He talks about them being in a different class. And part of what he's accused of has to do with people who were not altogether there, who were institutionalized, situations like that. So it's pretty bad. Then he goes to high ground. And when you take moral high ground, and you try to compare yourself to somebody. Jesus is not a good choice. You don't take the highest ground and say, hey, Andy hung around in brothels. But with what you're doing, and you'll see this in your day job, what you're doing when you associate with someone who has that marked status is you're trying to take that status for yourself. People who live in Princeton who, who assume they're smart because they live near the university are those kind of folks. What he's doing here is a couple of things. We talked about gaslighting in the beginning where he is using something to make it so large that it goes away. He's also using humor to smoke screen what's actually going on. And I think as you watch this and you see him with this banana come out, that becomes a trance move. You know, we, you've heard us talk about trances where you can't reach somebody. Eating is a trance-like state because my mouth is full. I can't talk to you. We're going to see him use a cigar the same way. I think this guy has got a lot of little hidden subroutines to give him power. Chase, what do you got? I agree. And uh, these little hidden subroutines are something that everybody's got and just about everybody you'll ever meet. And when he when he's saying the women of proper age, there's an immediate transition to a guilty facial expression. Type those three words into Google really quick and look at some Google images of guilty facial expression. You'll see Anthony Weiner. You'll see the Bill Clinton stuff. You'll see all kinds of stuff. And his face goes right into it. And it's perfect. You'll see it right away. The chin tucks down. The lips pull together. The eyebrows go up. And when he says... Uh, I like girls that don't know much, then transitions into I'm just like Jesus, then I'm boring so they have to leave me, and then I'm sort of a playboy, and then I'm not a playboy at all, and you have to have manners when it comes to women. In in one monologue there, and the banana here, is, I think, is a pacifier and an adapter, and he's using movement much like grandiose people do uh, during conversation to accomplish a three-pronged approach here. This is distract, calm themselves down, and take ownership over self and the conversation. So it's a three-pronged approach to this movement, adjusting socks and all this while somebody's talking. That's what's going on right here. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, look, everything is a distraction here. You've got the chaff of the of the banana going on there, okay? And and yes, it is to pacify him, I believe. It's also there as a comic. Like, there's nothing funnier than the banana. It's it's phallic. Uh, it's it's a bit of a ridiculous fruit. It's a crazy color as well. And and of course, he's wearing that you know crazy uh, tracksuit. You know, bold color, the jewelry, bold, bold gold to not only give status of course but also to shine to give people something else to look at the glasses so you can't quite see into his eyes um the way he'll land on certain um certain phrases and certain stresses jimmy savile was one of the biggest impersonations that any impersonator would be able to do but interesting enough him and rolf harris who again turned out to be a serial uh, offender 
in fact, uh, Jimmy Savile took Rolf Harris for a private tour of Broadmoor Hospital, the psychiatric hospital. I mean, <laughs> there's a, a web here of, of extraordinary offenders going on. So chaffing with the banana there. So we know that he knows that this is going to be a tricky interview because like any magician who's going to use smoke and mirrors, he's already loaded his banana. He's already got a loaded banana in his pocket, ready to go, ready to go just in case. And he should know that it's going to be tough because uh, Andrew Neal was an editor of a newspaper. So Andrew Neal possibly knows the rumours or the facts that are already going around and have been going around for decades around uh, Jimmy Savile. Um, look, you know, it's comic as well. It's a classic. Emmett Kelly, the great um, uh, American clown with Ringling Brothers, one of his acts was to eat a, a raw cabbage and cry. You know, if in doubt, if the act that he got was going badly wrong, wasn't getting the laughs, whip out a cabbage, eat it, cry. It's a winner. I think that he knows the same. If you whip out a banana and eat it, you, you're going to attract people's attention. You're going to get people back to where you need them. So he's he's a he's a serial predator. Therefore, he's looking for innocence. And so there's that idea of I like the girls who don't know much. He's looking. He's, any predator isn't looking for a fight. A predator is looking for people who have no power and therefore are likely not to have any agency whatsoever. Like go to hospitals where people can't move because they've had such serious accidents and spinal injuries, and their kids that they just won't be able to fight back in any way whatsoever. This was, or, or maybe turn up at some morgues as well. And, uh, you know, he, he he would volunteer to shift around bodies in the dead of night. Uh, there's nobody who can fight back less than a dead human being. So this is the kind of person we're dealing with. So again, he's hiding behind, just as you were saying there, Greg, that banter, that British banter, hiding behind that, that parrying and that jousting that's going on. And of course, it looks very normal to us for him to be doing that because again, we've got, we got somebody Scottish having a bit of a banter with somebody English, Northern English, to, you know, to be so, so not so much animosity, but still it's fair to have a lot of strong banter with if you're, if you're English with somebody from Scotland. So it's all hidden in exactly the right cultural way that this audience will be laughing at what we now know to be somebody hiding the huge misdemeanors that they've they've been part of. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? I think what we're seeing is uh, like I think you guys were talking about earlier on one side on, at one point he's the greatest guy in the world and the other point he's depraved you know bad guy and again he blows this stuff up to make it go away. And when he talks he keeps calling himself a gentleman during this. I mean, there's no, there's no, everybody knows he's, he's not, he's, he's no gentleman, you know, but this reminds me of like one of those eighties bands when they first started getting famous and they think they were real famous, but they're only famous in their town. The way they would act, it's exactly the way this guy has acted. You know, having been a record producer, I, I knew a lot of those bands and they were, and they would all act just like this guy, like it was all, it was nothing. And that banana, I think is part of him be it's showing that he's rebellious because he's eating on TV. That's where I think his ego is taking him. I, I, I agree with you, Chase. I think this, this is narcissism. He, it's huge. I mean, it's, he's, he's, he thinks he owns the world right now because he's not busted yet. So, which I, I don't know the story how it ends up with him, but I know he gets, uh, does he get in trouble for this, Mark? He dies. Oh, he before, dies. He dies before. Oh. Yeah. 2011, wow. he died. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Oh, man. And then the revelations come out. Yep. Oh, that's horrible. Yeah. Scott, who was the any... most humble person you, you worked with as a record producer? Um, gosh, there was there were quite a few of them. Mostly the, the most humble are the best musicians in the world, period. The best singers in the world, period. Um, Jerry Douglas, best dobro player in the world. He is, he's just the, I've known him longer than I haven't known him since I was a kid. Greatest guy in the world. So Alison Krauss. Just sweet as she can be, and just could not be any more concerned with 
fame or being one of the best swingers on the planet than you would be about m- what's in you know my coffee cup or you know what, what how good my coffee That's is. Cool. Doesn't care. So they're real. A, a, quite a lot of them are actually uh, really good people. You know, but the metal bands, that's where you got to, that's where you got to, you get those egos because it's all about egos and, 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 all, you know, getting girls and all that. That's why they're in it. Most of them. Some are in it for the art and music, I'm sure. I didn't meet any of those, but I'm sure there are some <laughs> in that. Um, You're going to get every that. metal fan now, you know, writing down below. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but you don't know Maiden. Yeah. They're, fa- you know, they're all really oh, nice. It's Ozzy. Yeah. Ozzy's the kindest. <laughs> But you know what? I always heard he was, I never met him, but I always I heard he was the, the greatest guy in the I, world. You know, I heard the same and he, people. Didn't Eddie Van Halen, didn't know him well, but when I'd see him, he'd say my name, but I don't know. He wouldn't, have, I think at some point, if I'd run up and, and kicked him, he wouldn't know who to tell the cops it was, you know, but he was the nicest guy in the world. You know, you'd think that those guys would be, you know, nuts. But anyway, back to it. Uh, after the discussion about the number of women that he'd been with, he, that's when he starts talking about himself being a gentleman. You can't have it both ways. You're not you're not a womanizer and a gentleman too. You can you can be that the uh, creepy guy who thinks he is and do that, or you can be a gentleman, one or the other. So I think that's you know, kind of got away from him there. Uh, yeah. So and Mark, is it is it banana or banana? I, I say banana. You you may okay. say something else. Yeah, I say banana. Okay. I know I've heard uh, Chase say banana a lot, and I was wondering if we were all doing that now. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Brits will notice put an R after anything if you say the word "and" after it. So if Mark says "banana and," it will have an R at the end. Banana, banana. and yeah, so, banana. So, so does Boston. So does Boston. Oh, Boston's <laughs> the worst, man. There's this guy up. Uh, uh, one of my best friends, Paul Romano, and he wanted me to teach him how to speak Southern. And so, and I said, well, I'll say magic marker because he would say magic maca. Yep. And I'd say, no. My, and so I said, this is, this is go slow magic. And he go magic. And I go marker. And he go maca. Couldn't do it to this day. I don't think he <laughs> that's funny. Do an R. You know? Did you guys notice when he started talking about Jesus, the whole chatter, everything in the room went dead. All of that laughter went away. All that laughter went away. That's it. one of those tape replays. He's always had a knife for the ladies. Um, young ones as well. When I say young, I mean, you know, the proper age. 16 upwards. <laughs> and uh, he's always had one. His philosophy would never get married because I don't think he could stick with a person more than three days. And I don't think he can still stick it with anybody more than three days. Is he right? When it comes to women, you've got a short attention span? No, women know too much. I'm all for girls that don't know too much. It's a different class, you see. Uh, when you are single, it's because of some reason that you like being single. Uh, uh, Jesus didn't find any problem with it. I don't find any problem with it. Uh, a lot of the time, <laughs> people say, what? You're still single? You never got married? Why didn't you get married? The answer is, I have the faintest idea. But we don't, don't believe know. that J- Jesus was quite a ladies' man. Though you are, or have said you were. No, no, no. He used to knock about with the ladies. It says so in the book. He went in the the, the Ucky house. He was talking to them in the Ucky house. Uh, Did you get... He was was ducking and diving. So you were like him too? You were doing the same thing? No, I'm not like him at all. I was just saying, another famous person. He's a famous person. He was single. It's good enough for him. It's good enough for me. But... Do you get bored after three days with the same female company as uh, your friend was saying? I'd stay with them for the rest of the... They get bored with me. I'm a very boring fella. But if they get bored with you or you get bored with them or whatever, mm. we're talking about a life, are we, in the 60s and 70s of lots of lovers, lots of female company? Oh, that's a long time ago. I've forgotten now. You can't remember how many? No, the marks. I've got are there any marks there. I don't know. No, they've healed rather well. Oh, they healed. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. H- have you had lots of female I would hope so, because being alive a long time, I would have hoped that one would have had lots and lots of them. But... Uh, uh, but you I've got remember? this terrible... Me- oh, unfortunately, no, you see. I've, I've got this... And anyway, I'm not... I never have been a grass. And a gentleman never grasses on ladies that has ever... But we're not asking for names. We're oh. just asking for the general principle. Oh, so I mean... We just I mean, want to know if you live this sort well, of would playboy say, life of the DJ. Yeah, give or take a few nice ladies. <laughs> but I mean... You know, you... Uh, 
a gentleman doesn't ever speak of ladies. Well, I don't know where you come from. I mean, I don't know what your circles are, but my circle, <laughs> ladies, are very... You don't grass on them. No. All my mother ever told me was not to eat while I was talking, but that was another issue. <laughs> um, Bananas but, uh, weren't around in those days. <laughs> <laughs> Why have you shied away from close relationships with women? I'm quite happy to have a few close relationships tonight, if anybody's not spoken for. But why in the past no, have you... After the Joe ladies, a few close relationships, I'm, I'm all for it. I'm sure the offer will be taken up, but why good, in the past... Good, good, Why in the past have you I've avoided... I've been trouble again. Why in the past have you avoided close relationships? Because I've never been in the same town more than about 48 hours at any one time. It's just a lifestyle I've got, it's not my fault. But if you met somebody that you felt that you wanted to be close to, that I lifestyle... I fell in love every matter. day of my life. Oh, every day of my life I fall in love. Two, three, four times a day. I could get married immediately. Except the lights change and you have to drive off because I go in the other way or, or, or the train pulls out of the station and you're going, I want to marry you. <laughs> but on the platform. No, I, my passions are very near the surface. But I get well, well in love is, very quickly. But therefore, from the way you talk, have, have relationships and sex been hey? casual? <laughs> Is that a casual matter he, for you? He mentioned the S word. But well, we had to get round to it eventually. Did you? Well... Oh, you're talking to the wrong guy here. Oh, Mr. No Grass here. Is it just casual? What? Sexual relationships. <laughs> what relationships? <laughs> no, no. Oh, I, I've read about them. Yeah, I've read... Not in your papers, but I've read about them in the smaller papers. And, yeah, see what you mean now. Yeah. No, well... Obviously, if a lady has been upset and she has said to me, only a relationship, like as what you mentioned, I can't use that word, uh, if a relationship will make me less happy, I'll say, feel free to use me, I say. Feel free to use me. I will sacrifice myself to you any time of that. And then they say, thank you very much, and then they go, no, that's not my fault. It's not down to me. Uh, <laughs> ladies. But it's a, Here it's a, is a perfectly honest man. Tell you know. All right, Chase, what do you got? There is an undercurrent in this specific video that I want to make you glaringly aware of so that you can spot this stuff in the future when you see people get interviewed. Really quickly, I'm just going to ping on each little thing. There's awkwardness. There's avoidance, overcompensation, resistance, stress, a need for approval from the audience, and pacifying gestures to calm himself down. If you're seeing this in behavior in a person in this position and with this background who would reasonably provide answers to these questions, even if the answers were nondescript or lacking in detail, most people would reasonably say yes or no, or I don't want to talk about it, I'm not comfortable talking about it, then you're probably seeing evidence that something much more powerful is being hidden about the same subject. Unwilling to answer about surface level stuff means something is very much hidden about the deeper stuff in the same subject matter. This one behavior uh, would have allowed you to predict the downfall of about a dozen people and even one Hollywood producer and one famous uh, comedian who's been in the news uh, within the last few years. Uh, so before anyone ever even whispers about it you'll be able to spot these things in the future just with this one little thing scott what do you got all right um he tries to redirect and amuse everybody and get connected with the audience every time they start zeroing in again on something that would that he's familiar with it's something that could get him in trouble and even though it's they're not saying you can get in trouble for this it's something around what he's done in the done up to that point that he brings that's brought to his mind and that's why he does that so he can get away from that he's running in other words he's throwing up all this stuff to get away um and he tries to isolate himself by doing that by that laughing and, and making it into a show because it's all about him at this point no matter what of course it is because it's this is your life so it would be but he keeps drawing it back to himself he's not being humble here at all there's nothing uh, it just I, personally, it wouldn't look like, look like somebody, even though he's a funny guy or supposedly was funny. I don't be somebody I want to hang out with because he's so creepy. Um, and his and his humor is the worst. This is a, this is just like the lowest common denominator for funny stuff. And I know he's trying to appeal to everybody, 
but man, it's horrible. He's not, I don't think he's funny. I didn't giggle or smile or laugh once. I don't think this guy is funny at all. Uh, his illustrators get, get huge. And his voice volume gets really loud. Again, when they start digging in deeper to what's happening there. So when the interviewer does, so he, he's like you, like you and uh, Greg, you and Mark said earlier, he's hiding in plain sight. He's, and th I think, Maybe he can't believe he's getting away with it or thinks he's so smart he's getting away with it. Obviously, he did since he had he didn't get in trouble till after he did so much found out till after he was dead. But like Mark said, he was blessed by the Pope. So man, they that going for him. I don't know. Um, which was nice. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which is nice. Um yeah, that's I'll leave it. I'll leave it there. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so we talked uh when we talked about Russell Williams hiding in plain sight, this guy had access to royalty. We'll find out later, very close access to royalty. He was a national treasure, as Mark said, so people trusted him. What I want you to pay attention to is the difference between how he answers questions that are pointed and have character assassinating um, intent to the ones that might be just off the cuff. So, for example, later they're going to talk to him about money and his entire demeanor changes. There's no gaslighting. There's none of this stuff where he goes too big and goes too farcical to make it so ridiculous that it doesn't matter. But here, every time they bring up something as character assassinating, he goes big, he goes wide. And this is when I say people have subroutines, it's got a roach when the light comes on, their legs automatically move. They don't have to think about it because they've done it so many times. And the longer you've hidden and the better you've hidden, the more likely you are to have those kinds of things. Watch what he does. That chewing that banana is a stall. It gives him time to think. The lifestyle is a logical response. Hey, my lifestyle is different from yours and. But that feigned shock and breaking the fourth wall as he looks at the audience and draws them back in, that's his style to insulate and protect. One of the best ways to hide in plain public is just humor. If you make something ridiculous, I used to work with guys who, if you told something funny, like, you know, Scott, you, you always are joking around. They'd be like, ha, 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 and you'd feel stupid just because of the way they laughed at you. And that worked. It diffused whatever they were doing. So if you deal with people like that and they know how to do this, they're, what they're doing is another form of gaslighting by making something so large, then shrinking it, or they're just spouting out so much stuff that they're ga they are creating a smoke screen. And I think he's a combination of things. And the way you're going to be able to tell, and Chase, you're dead on about ha people having these styles of ways of hiding things, and we get to another serious topic later, has nothing to do with sexuality. Watch the difference in the way he responds. Watch the difference in the way he responds with words, even though it's an accusation. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so there are no direct accusations here of of any any abuse at all. Really, what this is 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 a questioning of his character, just as you're saying there, Greg. And so what does he do? Um, well, again, he 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 denies. Uh, any association by going, I can't even use that word. So he's not even going to associate himself with the word of sex, let alone the, the act. Um, he then says, again, he turns it on its head. He then says, Oh, I'm in trouble again. So he knows the moves of comedy. He knows that reversal is a key thing to, to comedy, though he himself is by no means any great comic. And I don't think anybody in Britain would have ever said, hey, Jimmy Savile, a great comic, but definitely an entertainer. And an entertainer being somebody who can just hold the audience. It, that's the medieval Latin, entretenir, to hold together. So all the entertainer is doing is is can we can we hold attention? Can we get attention? And absolutely, he's one of Britain's key attention getters. And that's why the uh, certain members of the royal family came to him for for help, for branding help, essentially, is in that he was one of the first people to brand himself as an entertainer, as something unique and incredibly uh, individual. Um an extraordinary and and um well something that grabbed the attention of, of the British public during the 60s and and onwards. But really he's got this this parody of of the villain going on and parody of the saint going on at the same time. Saint and villain, saint and saint and villain all the time. Uh, he says, feel free to use me, feel free to use me. So again, he makes himself the victim. Again, that reversal there, which is a classic for abusers to make themselves out to be the victim. Here, he's using it to, to, to hide his abuse. And at the same time, it's a comic ideal as well to do that 
reversal. It's not great comedy by any stretch of the imagination, but it serves two purposes there. One last thing to note here that I quite like, which is the aggressive bite of the banana that happens there. So so there is something quite predatorial that he's showing us there on the banana uh, and then holds it in his mouth with the bits, uh, you know, spread out, just like you'd expect in a um, in an American cartoon when the dynamite explodes. You get the same peeled back banana. So it's like he really knows the, the memes of... Uh, or memes, whichever way you want to go. I know you you want to pick me up on that one. The memes or memes of uh, of comedy, but there isn't anything really very funny about him. He can do the the manoeuvres, but he's not a great act as a comedian. There, that's all I got on that one. It's like he's like one of those um, savants because they're savant because they got hit in the head with something, and they play piano very well, but they don't say anything. Mm-hmm. They're playing. You know what I mean? They're just. And all the everything sounds were in place, but they're not saying anything. You know what I mean? That's the kind he's of gotten away with this. This has been his organism for since the 50s, 40s, probably, Mark. 40s, right? Like nine people have laughed. Yeah, at I mean, certainly the, certainly the 50s. He was there, there in the early days of Cliff Richard, you know, alongside him, early days of the Beatles, you know, pirate radio DJ, right at the very, very beginning of, of popular culture, youth culture. Wow. One of those tape replays. Why have you shied away from close relationships with women? I'm quite happy to have a few close relationships tonight, if anybody's not spoken for. Okay, why in the past no, have you gone after the show, ladies? A few close relationships. I'm, I'm all for it. I'm sure the offer will be taken up. But why good, in the past? Good, good. Why in the past have you I've avoided? Been again. Why in the past have you avoided close relationships? Because I've never been in the same town more than about 48 hours at any one time. It's just a lifestyle I've got. It's not my fault. But if you met somebody that you felt that you wanted to be close to, that I lifestyle... I fell in love every day of my life. Oh, every day of my life I fall in love. Two, three, four times a day. I could get married immediately. Except the lights change and you have to drive off because they're going the other way. Or, <laughs> or, or the train pulls out of the station and you're going, I want to marry you. <laughs> but they're on the platform. No, I, I, my passion is very near the surface. But I get well, well in love, if, very quickly. But therefore, from the way you talk, have have relationships and sex been hey? casual? <laughs> Is that a casual matter he, for you? You mentioned the S word. But we had to get round to it eventually. Did you? Well... Oh, you're talking to the wrong guy here. Oh, Mr. No Grass here. Is it just casual? What? Sexual relationships. <laughs> what relationships? <laughs> No, no. Oh, and I've read about them. Yeah, I've read, not in your papers, but I've read about them in the smaller papers. And, yeah, see what you mean now. Yeah. No, well, obviously, if a lady has been upset and she has said to me, only a relationship, like as what you mentioned, I can't use that word, uh, if a relationship will make me less happy, I'll say, feel free to use me, I say. Feel free to use me. I will sacrifice myself to you any time of that. And then they say, thank you very much, and then they go. Now, that's not my fault. It's not down to me. I'm not scared of that, ladies. But it's a, Here so is a perfectly honest man. Tell you. No. <laughs> so, but relationships are not a serious matter, then, for you. It is a matter no. to joke about. Yeah. It's not, it's not serious. No. Have, you, have you never been seriously in love? No. Never? No. Why do you think that is? I'm the friendest idea. Most people have been in love at some stage in their lives. Yeah. Some yeah, from when you watch the TV and you look at all these films and things, and, and sometimes as much as it's uh, puffed up to be, that love game. You've never even felt you might have, might have been falling in love? Never no. even been tempted to fall in love? No. Never at all? No. You also give this impression that you've had in your life, as lots of DJs had all these girlfriends and so, and so on, and lived this great single life with lots of lovers and so, we never see any of them. We never even a snapped picture by me, the paparazzi. Me too. Me too. Do they? they don't. Well, they don't <laughs> really exist, do they? Not they, really. They don't no. really exist. No, no, they don't. I told you I was boring. But is, is it just a facade? All the, the, yes. the, the playboy image. Yes. Yes, I'm. Very... Or is that answer part of the facade? No, no. <laughs> you can't. You can't win here. <laughs> Go. Uh, it's all part of the facade, and uh, 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 I am very boring. Thank God. 
Uh, Mark, what do you got? Well, the banality of the banana, uh, which is he's got this banana and he's literally doing lint picking from the banana. It's so, you know, lint picking, which is when, you know, you're picking. So it, it kind of suggests, hey, I don't really need to pay a lot of attention to what's going on here. It's demeaning to the people around you. He's doing that on a banana. I don't think I've ever seen that before. I mean, I'm 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 willing for somebody in the in the uh in the uh down below to go, no, no, no. There's been a lot of lint picking on bananas uh in your shows, but I don't think I've ever seen that before. That's pretty new. Another one that I haven't seen is venting with the trousers, venting with the pants. He pulls his pants out and uh, and lets go of the elastic, makes an audible sound. So it's it's percussive. It's almost almost the end of a punchline. It has a sense of of status. Of it's almost like the ping of the the vaudeville ping of the braces, but it's on the trouser band, which which for me again does a bunch of things. It means that he can vent. It means that that he can get rid of hot air because this is pressure for him for sure it means he can play a status sig signal at the same time and have a gag and play a classic of comedy at the same time um and now he's going to bring out his other prop which was a classic prop for him which is the cigar again the cigar shows status not many people in the uk would smoke cigars show status it's phallic as well so it's a little bit rude it's a little bit rude so he gets to be a little bit rude and show high status by pulling out the cigar and give himself time to think give himself something to do while he's trying to work out how he's going to navigate around what is one of the hardest interviews that he ever had i believe this this particular interview uh scott what you got on this one i i, I think it'd be safe to say that i've had a little more experience in talking to people like this than most of us in here and i know it as you all do i know what this is when i when you when you see him up to this point that many videos in you see that and you go i know it apparently um nobody else saw it we wouldn't be able to be out in the wild and say oh look at this guy on tv that's what he is but when you get them in a room and start talking to them and they're this glib and they're this shallow and they when every time a person is brought up they're they they see people no, no different than a bug or some kind of a, a little problem or something or a plant that's what we're i'm not saying this guy's a psychopath but he sure is checking off a lot of boxes for that situation um he claims never having feelings for anyone um and still is and even in his interview he says uh, the people don't exist um and then Saville, Saville says no they don't when he's talking about the people that he deals with those people don't exist no they don't this is he started to check boxes for me in here and when you see somebody like this and you get that one little hint that they may be into the kind of stuff that he was into it all start everything starts falling into place and you go oh i see what this is i see exactly what i'm doing I'm dealing with one. I'm, as you guys know, dealing with one now. That that's not this bad, but it's a different, uh, completely different situation. But when you talk to this guy, the first time I talked to him, I said, "Oh, I get it. I see exactly what we're dealing with here. I knew exactly what it was." Uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, Mark, I'm going to start right where you stopped around the lint picking the banana we've never seen before. It's the same as lint picking anything else. What it's doing is saying. I got no time for you. Regardless, what they're doing is making self unavailable. He does the same thing, lighting the cigar. He makes, he removes himself entirely. He goes internal. He isn't really, he's paying very close attention. But what happens with people, especially if they're doing horrific acts, is they have to compartmentalize that so that it doesn't show up. And compartmentalization is a good thing. Chase talked about it in a recent video where we talk about a person who is a gunfighter, a person who is, who interrogates prisoners. All of us have to be able to turn things on off. Surgeons ambulance drivers we all have to be able to put that in a separate box but there are noble causes and not so noble causes for compartmentalization and the ability to put those things away you all understand it i always say this to people because trauma is the nature of human life you've lost somebody you love in your life and that part of that person is still with you but they're also compartmentalized and live in a different space for you if they didn't you couldn't bear the pain over time so we learn how to deal with things in a different way However, when it's up to no good, it makes it easier for a person to hide in plain sight. And I think that's what you see. When you interrogate what you're after is bringing that person into, I refer to it as cat brain often, but you're taking them out of their 
frontal lobe into that responsive brain. There's a video that's viral right now of this child in a very hot car and his father is trying to take the child out is breaking the windshield out that's because that limbic brain has taken over and they're trying to rescue this child not considering breaking out a back glass a side door or any of that and then even more when the person finally gets in the car they hand the child out through the glass through the shattered glass that's because our brains are not capable of thinking when we get to a certain point so in an interrogation we'll poke and prod and poke and prod and poke and prod until the person responds and use psychological ploys to get the information we want in this case this person is sitting behind a big facade and a role that he is well created and the interesting piece is he doesn't for me chase or Scott, but he owns real estate in Mark's head, clearly. He wrote, owns real estate in everyone who grew up in UK's head. He's there. So he already has that comedy piece. He doesn't have to be funny. I often say, if you go to a comedy club and drink alcohol, you get in there and listen. Some of the stuff those guys are saying is the stupidest stuff you've ever heard, but people are laughing at it anyway because they expect it. Mark, I think that's part of how they hold it. Um, I'm not going to go in a whole lot more, but he tries hard to get insulation from the audience. He, he's constantly pulling the audience in. Just pay attention to that and look for why it matters then. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, and I will say uh, you don't need to be a gunfighter to have compartmentalization. I did nine uh, deployments over in the place that you're probably thinking about right now. You want a really good example of a, a good person with compartmentalization? Think about a pediatric oncologist. That's uh, yes. uh, an example yep. there. And one thing that uh, if you're a subscriber for a long time, or if this is new to you, I want to I want you to get this principle into your life uh, because it's going to change your life. Pay attention to what's being concealed, what's missing, and what's hidden or unable to be answered or spoken about in every conversation that you that you have with anybody. If you're in sales, it's helpful. If you're a parent, it's very helpful. And what's being hidden? What's What should reasonably be there and what's being hidden? Right here, what's reasonably there in every conversation is somebody says, I don't want to talk about that, or that makes me uncomfortable. Or, yeah, maybe I've done some of that stuff and I'm kind of ashamed of it. Nothing. There's nothing here. And to show you how pervasive this is, uh, what is one thing that you'll see in every commercial, every advertisement, every sales page? People tell you the problem that they're trying to solve. You go to Home Depot and buy a drill. You're trying to solve a problem, right? You need a hole in something and you go buy a drill. So the, the problem that you're trying to solve is there. Apple, Macintosh, whatever you want to call them, just launched these VR glasses. And I just watched the little, I don't know, three, four minute promo they did for that. Apple didn't openly say what problem they're trying to solve because they can't openly discuss it. And so I want you to know that this is in every aspect of your life. What is the problem that these VR goggles are trying to really solve? Loneliness, sadness, and an anesthetic for real life. One of those tape replays. <laughs> so, but relationships are not a serious matter then for you. It is a matter no. to joke about. Yeah. It's not, it's not serious. No. Have, you, have you never been seriously in love? No. Never? No. Why do you think that is? I'm the friend of dare. Most people have been in love at some stage in their lives. Yeah. Some yeah, from when you watch the TV and you look at all these films and things, and, and sometimes as much as it's uh, puffed up to be, that love game. You've never even felt you might have, might have been falling in love? Never nope. even been tempted to fall in love? No. Nope. Never at all? No. Nope. You also give this impression that you've had in your life, as lots of DJs had all these girlfriends and so, and so on, and lived this great single life with lots of lovers. We never see any of them. We never even a snapped picture by me, the paparazzi. Me too. Me too. Do they? they don't, well, they don't <laughs> really exist, do they? Not they, really. They don't no. really exist. No, no, they don't. I told you I was boring. But is, is it just a facade? All the, the, yes. the, the playboy image. Yes. Yes, or I'm. Is that, very... Or is that answer part of the facade? No, no. <laughs> you can't. You can't win here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's all part of the facade, and uh, 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 I am very boring. Thank God. Thank God. Well, let's see if we can get a bit further on this, because we spoke to the very oh. Reverend Colin Semper. Oh, He's Colin. He's the canon of Westminster and producer yes. of your Radio 1 religious chat shows. Yes. Called Speakeasy. He told us this. The relationship which was quintessential to him uh, was that with his mother, 
the Duchess. That was all important, and I sometimes feel that if he had had a long and lasting other relationship than that, rather than this nomadic existence, it might have been more fulfilling for him in his life. So according to the canon, is it, is it really because you had this special relationship with your mother that you found it difficult to create other relationships with other women? Unfortunately, no. Unfortunately. It would make life easy so. if I could say yes, but the Duchess had no part in this nefarious li knife of mine uh, after dark, which was the pop world. But it would be true to say that the Duchess, mm. your mother, mm is the only woman that you've really had a special close relationship with? No. Well, that's what you said earlier on. You said you hadn't had anybody, anybody else. I tell lies when it suits me. <laughs> I've had plenty of close relationships. But like I said, Mr. No Grass here, I've forgotten every single one, not forgotten them, but I cannot even recall any one of them just now. I could understand the reticence if we were asking for names, but yeah. we're not. No. It's simply a principle. Not now, but after this TV show, all the tabloids come on and say, right, we'll have a few names now then, well, Jim. Well, they've been doing that, <laughs> they've been doing that for, for years anyway. But don't you find that Whoa. because of this relationship with your mother, <laughs> hey? because of this relationship with your mother, yeah. it has overpowered relationships that you might have had with other women? No, if I took a girl home while she was there, she'd sling them out if I went to the loo. <laughs> She do that, but not because she had anything going for for me as a son. But she didn't want anybody uh, nicking her life of luxury off her, so she she kick him out the door a bit lively. So she was possessive. As, as, as I'm sure a lot of mothers will do with some. So she was like a that. possessive oh, mother. Her get him. She eh? was possessive. No, not really. Not really. But she, she was frightened no, of she losing was, you. No, she was a survivor. But she was frightened of losing you? Yeah, no, no, no. What she didn't want was for me to walk in and say, hey, you know that girl I brought in last week? Yeah, well, she's going to move in here and you're going to move out. Who didn't want any of that? Out. Get out. Little fixin'. Do you think that stuck with you ever bosses. since? Get out, Jose. But has that coloured your attitude ever since, you think? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I used to sneak him in the back then. Or I used to give her a few quid to go away on holiday and then I could take him in then. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so this feign trembling at the beginning is more that ridicule style to diminish anything upcoming, even before he knows. The minute he realizes that it is a cleric, he changes. He's not so irreverent anymore, because I think he realizes the audience didn't appreciate the first one. If you don't think the audience is insulation, look at him as his mother issue comes up. Look at him reaching for the audience, trying to draw them in. And he's, again, doing this cigar tra trancing thing. But he also, when the mother issue comes up, this makes me really want to poke and prod and ask questions because he retreats against the back of his chair pretty seriously. And then he goes back to farce, I've forgotten. Then he goes to the logic of why he's doing it. He turtles, he, he, but his left hand is balled up when this whole thing around his mother and lack of relationships and all of that come up. When he talks about his mother saying that nobody else would get him, there's just awkward body language and a nervous smile that lets me know this is hitting too close to home for him compared to some of the other stuff. Maybe it's because, you know, he lost his mother and there's a whole lot of baggage associated with that. But then when he when he does say that one thing where he says no one else will ever get him, he's saying his mother's saying she's just like all mothers. No one else will ever get him. Well, I don't think that's true. And then he tries to pull the audience in. And when he tries to pull the audience in, he gets nothing. And then he makes a big smile and there's no eye involvement. I, I think this one, more than any other thing we've seen, hit home somehow. We don't know why. We don't know what. We don't know all the details. But whether it's because his mother sabotaged something, he had a bad, a weird relationship, can't tell. But this one, I think, hits close to home. Mark, what do you think? Yeah, it's always difficult to, to work out fully what was happening between him and his mother, often referred to as the Duchess. Um, maybe the Duchess because of the authority that she had. Maybe the Duchess because uh, the level that she wished to live and hang on to him uh, at that economic uh, level. Uh, there's probably a whole bunch of uh, psychologists you can go and listen to talking about what that relationship might be. Look, certainly it's very clear that when this canon comes on, canon of Westminster, so I'm guessing that's probably Westminster Catholic Cathedral, canon there. Um, uh, Jimmy was, uh, Savile was, was a um was a, a catholic uh had audiences with the pope uh, so again you know 
how can this person hide there that seems, you know, to people who don't, where he doesn't hold that other real estate, you'll go, okay, clearly uh, grandiose narcissist, uh, clearly potentially psychopathic, um, you know, uh, you know, high, uh, does acts among at risk youth. I mean, there's, there's elements there that won't mean there's going to be abuse uh, in, in every case, of course, but you know, it's, it's stacking up around potential, why would the British public uh, be duped? Well, this is somebody who raised more money than any other individual in the UK for children's hospitals. So who would go out and run marathon after marathon after marathon in order to raise money for uh, charity. This is the person who was given his own room at Broadmoor Hospital, where he probably should have been incarcerated as one of the biggest villains that Britain ever saw, was given keys to the back door of Broadmoor to be able to get himself in there and stay there over overnight. So surely the British public would go, well, if he's trusted in this kind of way by our authorities, by Edwina Curry, who was, uh, who was um, you know, in charge of Broadmoor at the time, if he's trusted in this way, then surely we should trust him. British public had no reason. To, to doubt that this was a eccentric person, yeah, but in a great long line of eccentric uh, entertainers. Well, I think it, at, at, at this point, um, we get this childlike jumping up and down on the chair again, this, this idea of innocence, uh, childlike, you know, somebody who would be around children who's like a bit of a, a child, an innocent, a, 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 a comic, a, a buffoon. Um, but then uh, also, I think we get the closest here to him being penetrated in some way. Has this coloured your attitude? says the interviewer, yeah, 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 now if A, and then he stops himself. Then he stops himself self, and he goes back in time and he goes, I used to sneak them in the back. So the interview here was about to get a moment of self, maybe not self-reflection, but a moment of confession as to what he does now. And that stopped. That was, uh, that was, uh, cut off. So closest we get to any break in his facade, I think, was that moment there. Uh, Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, y'all covered most of what I had. You're just seeing a desperation for social approval in the face of, uh, I won't say a terrible interviewer. I think the interviewer is doing a decent job at having some composure here. Definitely is not asking the questions that I would want him to ask in these instances scott i agree and i wondered about that but it's because it's this is your life you know is that show it's supposed to be how wonderful this guy is that's why they're doing the show if, I, if i'm correct about that this is that no this it's is, a response to that oh okay it's called, this it, one's called is this your life so it's kind of a reversal oh. or not quite a parody but a hard talk version of this is your life where you get oh. to interview. yeah yeah, yeah. Ask yeah. hard questions. Yeah, it's similar, but they're harder questions. Okay. All right. Well, I want to make the differentiation between a comic and a clown. This guy is not a he's he's not a comic. He's not a comedian. He's just a clown, and so that's what we're seeing. There's there's no there's no depth to anything. I'm sure whatever he would present is to be funny. There'd be no depth there either. There's no thinking about it. It just kind of is the lowest common denominator as it has been up to this point. I think he's using the cigar at this. By now, he's used it as everything. He's used it as a deflector. He's used it as an illustrator. He's used it as an adapter. He's using it for everything. So it's a great little tool. I think that was the same thing with a banana as well. I think back on, he's using it for all kinds of stuff. Um, that still just continues with the, the shallow and glib answers. Uh, he can't control this conversation. I think that bothers him too. So we're seeing that bit of agitation uh, flare up there. So that's why he gets so animated and a little bit louder. Than he has been, um, and I, I think that's a, this is a great example of a narcissist trying to take control of something, and he can't. And there's no reason for him to, since you're there. He's there to be asked questions, not an interrogation, but he's there to be asked questions apparently, and that's what that's that's why it's it's just it's pretty bad. Um, and I think that's what's driving him crazy. So, the, and the closer the interviewer still gets to the things that really happened, or he could be nailed for. 
that's when he starts starts acting that way and flipping out and being weird and, and trying to be funny. He turns into the clown, the fool, as you guys say. All right, that's all I got. We good? You know, yeah. just remember when we're talking about interviewing and interrogating this guy, Mark said it. He was a national treasure at this point. Mm. He's not Bob. He's somebody who has real estate in everybody's brain. Nobody has any idea he's done anything. So you probably have to be a little bit cautious where you go to, I would think. One of those tape replays. Thank God. Well, let's see if we can get a bit further on this, because we spoke to the very Ooh. Reverend Colin Semper. Oh, He's Colin. the canon of Westminster and producer yes. of your Radio 1 religious chat shows yes. called Speakeasy. He told us this. The relationship which was quintessential to him uh, was that with his mother, the Duchess. That was all important, and I sometimes feel that if he had had a long and lasting other relationship, than that, rather than this nomadic existence, it might have been more fulfilling for him in his life. So according to the canon, is it, is it really because you had this special relationship with your mother that you found it difficult to create other relationships with other women? Unfortunately, no. Unfortunately. It would make life easy so. if I could say yes, but the Duchess had no part in this nefarious knife of mine uh, after dark which was the pop world but it would be true to say that the duchess mm. your mother mm. is the only woman that you've really had a special close relationship with no well that's what you said earlier on you said you hadn't had anybody anybody else i tell lies when it suits me <laughs> i've had plenty of close relationships but like i said Mr. No Grass here. I've forgotten every single one. Not forgotten them, but I cannot even recall any one of them just now. I could understand the reticence if we were asking for names, but yeah. we're not. No. It's simply a principle. Not now, but after this TV show, all the tabloids come on and say, right, we'll have a few names now then, well, Jim. They've been doing that, <laughs> they've been doing that for, for years anyway. But don't you find that Whoa. because of this relationship with your mother, Hey. Because of this relationship with your mother, yeah. it has overpowered relationships that you might have had with other women. No, if I took a girl home while she was there, she'd sling them out if I went to the loo. <laughs> she'd do that, but not because she had anything going for, for me as a son, but she didn't want anybody uh, nicking her life of luxury off her, so she, she'd kick him out the door a bit lively. So she was possessive. As, as I'm sure a lot of mothers will do with some. So she was like a that. possessive oh, mother. Her get him. She eh? was possessive? No, not really. Not really. But she, she was frightened no, of she losing was, you? No, she was a survivor. But she was frightened of losing you? Yeah, no, no, no. What she didn't want was for me to walk in and say, hey, you know that girl I brought in last week? Yeah, well, she's going to move in here and you're going to move out. Who didn't want any of that. Out. Get out. Little vixen. Do you think that stuck with you ever bosses. since? Get out, Jose. But has that coloured your attitude ever since, you think? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I used to sneak him in the back then. Or I used to give her a few quid to go away on holiday and then I could take him in then. But you why in not be modestly generous with your family and friends? Well, I am. But it's more than their life is worth for them to tell you because what they get is plenty, but I wouldn't put it about because I'd rather people think I was a bit close. It cuts down the begging letters. Begging letters are all right. Nothing wrong with them. You don't pay them out. Do you think this uh, almost obsession with hey. money, I never, with holding never on to it... I've never talked about it in my life. Is that a compensation for other things you, in your life? No, because I never had them in the first place. That's number one. Number two, when you wake up in the morning and you don't have to go to work, that's not a bad thing, especially when you've had to get up at four o'clock in the morning and you walk, as I did, two miles to catch a bus and then you get a bus to the pit then you walk two and a half miles underground and doing six shifts a week for a pound and five pence does things to you and now there's no such thing to me as a tenner because that was nearly ten weeks work it's just that my mind thinks along those lines so you're still when you hold on to that tenner to you you're holding on to something I'm, I'm it seems to, a lot more sure 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 because because it's, if somebody says oh it's only a pound automatically my mind goes once upon a time, I worked six shifts a week for, for a pound and five pence. I'm afraid, whether it makes you antisocial or not, you can't ever forget that. Just like somebody can't forget thirsting to death in the desert, he'll never ever hold a glass of water and disregard it. It'll be an amazing thing for him. All right, Chase, what do you got? 
this is, this is the first time I believe him. And uh, what it seems from the, the previous videos and now seeing this is that he imprinted his mother's limiting beliefs. And he thinks it's all from the job that he had and the career that he had. So his mother's beliefs were rooted in what's commonly called a, a scarcity mindset kicking these girls out of the house and he's definitely adopted that now i'd venture to say that this is also not about money entirely what i think you just heard is him explaining how he views women just listen back when the replay comes up you'll hear having to work hard for something having to make sacrifices to get something and then a story about how he evolved out of the needing of that thing and that thing coming easier and easier to him and never forgetting how hard it was to obtain initially. So when I say scarcity of mindset, that just means this uh, belief about resources being very limited. If somebody else gains, that means I lose. And this kind of leads to competitiveness, fear, and focus on lack. And the opposite of that, I think this was a Stephen Covey book where this came out initially, would be the abundance mindset, where there's plenty for everybody, encouraging collaboration, uh, risk taking is is better and a focus on potential and opportunities. So these mindsets, scarcity and abundance, can become self fulfilling prophecies for all of us uh, and influence our behavior, our decisions, and our attitude towards uh, everybody, people around us. Greg, what do you got? I'm a little more simple in my approach to that same thing, though, Chase. What you what happens to you when you're young and then you layer over it is going to impact the rest of your life. If you're if you had no shoes when you're a kid, you're going to have more shoes or or maybe a good pair of shoes. What people do is their the scars are left with, and he says it, he calls it out. The scars are left with from their past, they're going to try to deal with. If you've walked through the desert and been very thirsty, a glass of water means something. I was you've been to Sears School. I would say the most valuable thing to me is not being in a box. The most valuable thing on earth to me is not being in a box. Put me in a box. I'm, I'm very unhappy. I know from a few days of experience. And all those people who go through something, whether it's whether they're poor when they're young or their parents are not in the picture, it affects their life forever. Now, how they carry about it, whether it's positive or negative, is what you just covered, Chase. Sometimes people come out of a very negative thing with a positive outlook. Hey, I made it out of it. And sometimes they go into it with a negative outlook. Hey, I made it out of it. But. So it's that mindset is going to be dependent on a lot of other factors and how you get there is one thing. And then there are lots of guys who've written books about how to get out of that mindset for sure. You can tell this is genuine. This is the danger to the guy, though. He's genuine when he talks about the begging letters, no big deal. You get to see him using his hands and illustrating and using full facial expressions as he's talking. There's no farce, no audience engagement, none of that, none of that. Why is it that when his character assassinating about sexuality, about those things, they go back and they poke him and he does all this kind of fool stuff. When he gets to real life, to real life, when he's talking about everyday things, we see what he's normally like. I would expect those two things are alike. If I'm defending one issue or the other and I'm being honest in both, I would expect the body language to be similar. That's why we call it a baseline. And if you compare this to those four things that happened before this, you'll see a grand deviation in baseline. Scott, what do you got? All right. I don't have much on this one, um, but we're just seeing more of his egoed out behavior and everything is that's happened that that's bad. He blames on somebody else or what happened to him in life. Everything and nothing is his fault, which again goes down the checklist for me. Um, he has, uh, he has lots of money, but he's a cheapskate. So that's, that's, he's trying to, to, uh, he comes on like he's got all this money and stuff, and he's such a great guy, but he doesn't help anybody with his with with his with his money. He gives them apparently nothing. So that's all I got on that one. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, it's interesting. There's a lot of layers here and some cultural ideas that I think he's trying to uh, attach to. So first of all, there's this bullying tactic. It's more than their life is worth to say what money he gives to his his um, his his relatives, but he says he do he do. He does give them some, but it's more than their life is worth to say that. You'll see this bullying comes up with him time and time again. This this keeping secrets, of course, that is a classic for uh, an abuser, especially around minors. This idea of don't tell anybody, keep everything a secret. It's an important, important tool. Um, I think he, 
I think the reason that he's happy to talk about the money and be seen as a miser or a potential miser rather than happy, happy to talk about sex and be seen as a potential um, womanizer or abuser is that the British public have never forgiven a serial abuser ever, especially anybody involved with, with, with minors or people uh, at risk in some way. I don't think there is an example ever of that happening. The British public have forgiven miser comedians, Ken Dodd being the classic example. Ken stuffed his roof full of money. He always thought the next day I won't be funny. He was Britain's greatest comedian, <laughs> arguably, and would stuff money in his roof until it was found. And then uh, Her Majesty said, you owe me several million in tax. The British public went, kind of went, no, he doesn't. He's been so funny that that he doesn't owe you or us anything. And he was let off the tax bill, as far as I can see. So it's quite good for Savile to go, you know what? I'm a bit tight. I'm a bit of a I'm a bit of a, a miser because it puts him alongside some of some other British greats in comedy. Not that he's one, but it puts him alongside British greats. There there are numbers of comedians who fit that exactly that same mold. Um but I don't think it's about that. I think he literally has no empathy. He and he and he's very clear with that. They can send their begging letters. You don't pay out. You pay no attention. You don't have any empathy for for other people. Uh, that's all I got on this one. Let's have another. I think when you meet this guy, going back to people you've met that are are nice or whatever or humble, this was the guy you'd meet. This personality that you're seeing on this show, that's the one you meet. It's not, there's nobody there. Hey, how are you? Not interested in you at all. It's all about him. So I think that's, this is what you would see when you first meet him. One of those tape replays. But why not pocket? be modestly generous with your family and friends? Well, I am. But it's more than their life is worth for them to tell you because what they get is plenty, but I wouldn't put it about because I'd rather people think I was a bit close. It cuts down the begging letters. Begging letters are all right. Nothing wrong with them. We don't pay them out. Do you think this uh, almost obsession with hey, money, I never, with holding never on to it... I've never talked about it in my life. Is that a compensation for other things yep. in your life? No, because I never had them in the first place. That's number one. Number two, when you wake up in the morning and you don't have to go to work, that's not a bad thing, especially when you've had to get up at four o'clock in the morning and you walk, as I did, two miles to catch a bus and then you get a bus to the pit, then you walk two and a half miles underground and doing six shifts a week for a pound and five pence does things to you and now there's no such thing to me as a tenner because that was nearly ten weeks work. It's just that my mind thinks along those lines. So you're still, when you hold on to that tenner, to you, you're holding on to something I'm holding that on seems to, a lot more. Sure, 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 because, because it, if somebody says, oh, it's only a pound, automatically my mind goes... Once upon a time, I worked six shifts a week for, for a pound and five pence. I'm afraid, whether it makes you antisocial or not, you can't ever forget that. Just like somebody can't forget thirsting to death in the desert, he'll never ever hold a glass of water and disregard it. It'll be an amazing thing for him. What has prompted you to devote so much time to charity? I've got nothing better to do. I've got, I don't work for a living. I stopped working for a living when I came out of the pit. I've never worked, done a day's work since. You've got nothing to do. What I'm going to do is sit and look at the wall. Just because I like it, I don't really have to justify why I like it. We spoke, Jimmy, to one of the people that you helped, Michael Rogers. He's a former Stoke Mandeville patient. He told us this. Jim's motives um, are probably twofold. Um, he has great sensitivity and uh, is very aware of, of uh, um, adversity in life or people's adversity in life and wants to do as much as he possibly can to help others but at the same time um, it's for his own glory and his own adoration um, which, which, which keeps him going what do you make of that your own glory your own adoration I live in a very peculiar business it's a business of flash no harm in being flash it's a business of 
having more front than Brighton and Blackpool put together. Nothing wrong with that at all. As long as it's at nobody else's expense, there's nothing wrong with it. It's a good, wholesome, fun-making thing. So, of course, if I come in here and sit down, mm -hmm. I say hello to the ladies and gentlemen, because I'm genuinely pleased to see them. It's, it's your nature. You don't have to justify what your nature is. So if somebody says, oh, what a flash geezer, I'd say, yeah. And they'd say, oh, look at him getting dressed up like that. I'd say, no man need be ashamed of his working clothes. I looked a lot funnier when I'd got covered in coal dust. Uh, <laughs> So therefore, you are what you are. It's part of the business. So in a way, Michael Rogers is right. Of course he's right. People got different opinions. All I can say is that I've been at Stoke and Broadmoor Hospital, Leeds Infirmary, for about 28 years, purely as a voluntary worker. I do it because I love it unashamedly. And 28 minutes is a gimmick. But 28 years, you've got to like it to stick it for 28 years. All right, I'll go first on this one. I think the guy in the video nailed it. And I think he he says he uh, likes be, being in that position to be able to, to go and help at hospitals and things because that's his hunting ground. That's where he does his damage or one of the, the places that he is, did his damage. And like Mark said, he could run free and do whatever he wanted to. That's why he was doing it. No other reason. You're right, Mark. Again, no empathy in this guy. That's what he was doing it for. That's why he was being so, such a good person because – that's his hunting ground. That's what he was going for. And I think Robert Hare said it best when he's, because he says the psychopath is a cunning and usually intelligent intraspecies predator. And that's the perfect place for him to do that. And it says everything. Somebody that would do that in that situation, do the things that he did, that, that right there, I think you don't need any more checks for the psychopath, uh, psychopathic personality type or antisocial anyway. Um, than that. I mean, that, that's pretty hard to get past, if you, if you ask me. All right, uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so you got some uh, some of Chase's closed eye talking right at the start there. Again, elevating himself, putting himself up as as being virtuous. He's going to love the idea of of somebody talking about the uh, the work that he does for charity because obviously it was a massive massive part of his life in order to show a strong facade that wouldn't be able to be penetrated in any way. Big wide fingers on this bit as well. So he's super confident about this. So just remember that just because people have big wide fingers doesn't mean they're not concealing something or, or lying to you. It just means they are showing confidence and they may be doing that unconsciously or consciously. And he's enough of a showman. I mean, this is a guy who, who was a, a wrestler in the early days uh, of, of putting on a show in the 60s. Um, and so he knows that he has to make a spectacle for people in order to sell his brand. So 28 years, Stoke Mandeville, uh, dealing with which deals with people with physical dif disabilities, often um, uh, children. Um, uh, look, his other his so he had apparently he had his own room at Stoke Mandeville Hospital and and the keys to anywhere he wanted to go. Uh, he had his own room at Broadmoor, so that was he was able to have private conversations with the Yorkshire Ripper, private conversations with Britain's biggest criminals, most extreme psychiatric case criminals. I mean, there's an argument that says. Maybe he was locking himself up in there as the penance that he that he should he should be doing doing the job that the that the British public should have done of catching him finding him out put, putting him through court and placing him in that institution uh, leads infirmary as well so a vo all voluntary work just as you say Scott so that he can get close to victims and it's easy pickings. For him, terrible, terrible uh, uh, state of state of affairs. Uh, Chase, what do you got on this one? There's one thing you'll hear us talk about all the time, and this is when somebody responds to an accusation by saying, "Well, I've volunteered at the local church. I've got a master's degree. I've given money to these people. I hold kids' hands when uh, they cross the street." This is called a resume statement, but I think we may be seeing a resume life right here, and. It seems pretty altruistic, but just taking what we 
our tremendous benefit of hindsight and some behavior analysis here. Let's go into three little topics here from you want to see behavior analysis. This is maybe what it classically looks like. First, it's a it, it's charity contribution can uh, serve as a really powerful tool for influence and persuasion. So by donating generously, Savile's able to cultivate this image of benevolence and kindness. And this public persona might have been a strategic move to gain authority or maybe trust of people. Second, these charitable actions could have just been uh, deflection or misdirection. So by focusing tons of attention on this philanthropy, he, he might have been attempting to redirect some negative attention from the other stuff that's going on in his life. I think it's also worth considering the possibility of a psychological phenomenon known as moral licensing here. And this is when people give themselves permission to engage in shady stuff because they've done something good. So in Savile's case, this charity could have been a way for him to justify or offset some of the guilt associated with some of his actions. I say this because he's literally, literally unable to say why he likes doing charity. That's bizarre. He can't even say that he just enjoys helping people. It doesn't come up. That's crazy. That's all I got. Greg? Greg? Yeah, it's more than that. He says, I don't have to justify. That is a defense. That's a defense. Nobody asks you to justify it. We're just ask you what you like about it. I don't have to justify. That would make me jump all over. Now, there are a couple of things. I always think about anything a person does and the motivation for it. Let's talk about altruism. I, when I write about people in general, I'm th- talking about them being on a continuum of some kind. Even Mother Teresa has to have some motivation that made her get up the first time, go over there and start taking care of people. And so there's a certain amount of selfishness in what we're doing as well, because we're getting rewarded for it. Somebody's going to be angry with me for saying there's self, there's not selflessness in a person who dedicated her life to it. Not saying that at all. But the motivation that causes you to get up one morning and go help other people, it's exactly the same thing as a motivation that causes somebody else to do something else. It's pleasing the self. Now, that there are lots of times that bad people do good things for for bad reasons to cover up their own selfishness and that's not what i'm talking about that that's what this guy is doing he's doing good things to hide bad things and that's because he's selfish and he's wanting to hide something but just think of people as being on a continuum and if you go so far in altruism that it's satisfying you, it's not satisfying anybody else. And Chase, you're, you're talking about something very similar there. What that person is doing is, is satisfying their own needs, and I don't have to justify. good friend of mine's sister, who was not Catholic, became a nun. And I said, how does that work out? He said, well, if you're Satan, it's easy to hide in church. And <laughs> maybe that says something about people. You know, they go find a place that they will not be questioned. And all of us know that the more good things you do, the less likely people are to think. You guys hear me say all the time, the more stellar a person appears to be without flaws, the bigger the flaws probably are. And Chase, you talk about people trying not to be who they were as children, it's all the same thing. This, I'll I'll just leave it at that and just say, he's been doing it for 28 years. That resume statement, that blasting out and covering, that's chaff, that's holy chaff, that's saintly chaff. That's whatever kind of chaff you want it to be. So that you'll follow it and you'll leave him alone about something else. One of those tape replays. What has prompted you to devote so much time to charity? I've got nothing better to do. I've got, I don't work for a living. I stopped working for a living when I came out of the pit. I've never worked, done a day's work since. I've got nothing to do. What I'm going to do is sit and look at the wall. Just because I like it, I don't really have to justify why I like it. We spoke, Jimmy, to one of the people that you helped, Michael Rogers. He's a former Stoke Mandeville patient. He told us this. Jim's motives um, are probably twofold. Um, He has great sensitivity and uh, is very aware of of, uh, um, adversity in life or people's adversity in life and wants to do as much as he possibly can to help others. But at the same time... um, It's for his own glory and his own adoration, um, which which, which keeps him going. What do you make of that? Your own glory, your own adoration. I live in a very peculiar business. It's a business of flash 
no harm in being flash. It's a business of having more front than Brighton and Blackpool put together. Nothing wrong with that at all. As long as it's at nobody else's expense, there's nothing wrong with it. It's a good, wholesome, fun-making thing. So, of course, if I come in here and sit down, mm -hmm. I say hello to the ladies and gentlemen, because I'm genuinely pleased to see them. It's, it's your nature. You don't have to justify what your nature is. So if somebody says, oh, what a flash geezer, I'd say, yeah. And they'd say, oh, look at him getting dressed up like that. I'd say, no man need be ashamed of his working clothes. I looked a lot funnier when I'd got covered in coal dust. Uh, <laughs> So therefore, you are what you are. It's part of the business. So in a way, Michael Rogers is right. Of course he's right. People got different opinions. All I can say is that I've been at Stoke and Broadmoor Hospital, Leeds Infirmary, for about 28 years, purely as a voluntary worker. I do it because I love it unashamedly. And 28 minutes is a gimmick. But 28 years, you've got to like it to stick it for 28 years. Well, you've had the kind of job that's allowed you to make a lot of money. As you say, it's given you the time to raise a lot of money for other people as well. And it's made you your own man. You, you like being in control of things and you like being in control of people. For example, why wouldn't you let your secretary of 25 years uh, speak to us and come on the program? Because secretaries spend their time secretarying and not grassing on their bosses. She knows where the secrets are. Is oh, no, right? no, no, she knows nothing. She's well, lovely, she's lovely. She's a little bit scared of you, is she not? A I mean, little bit, I should hope she's a lot. But she was oh, a lot, a because bit. when This Is Your Life was uh, doing you, and yeah. you know, that's a surprise, to be a surprise, she was so scared that uh, you would be angry that she hadn't tipped you off, that she did tip you off, that you were going to appear. Everybody tipped me off about everything. Yeah, on about. Nobody wants to die young. So you do want to be in control to no, the extent of being a I'm control just, no, freak. No, I things. like to know what's going on. Everybody wants to know what's going on in life. But you see, you know. always say what you see is what you get. You've got nothing to hide. Don't look for any scandal. There right. is none. Right. Here I am. Yeah. So when she pops up in this screen in a minute, will you fire her? Yes. <laughs> uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, uh, more of his uh, comic stylings, which is to flip between innocence and aggression. Everybody tips me off. Nobody wants to die young. That is a violent threat, essentially. But it's done within this context of, of innocence and an audience behind him and, and a brand in every viewer's head that causes the majority of British people, uh, you know, other than probably John Lydon, to go, to go, I think this guy's all right. It's okay for this one to make violent threats to people on uh, on national television. Uh, what an extraordinary state of affairs. So look, you know, there's nothing we can do in hindsight about these things, but it, but it is always interesting to just keep your wits about you as an individual and as a nation when you have these grandiose uh, characters who are, you know, wonderful and entertaining, and and the majority of them have no no bad bone in their in their body, but you know, if you see them seeking out to be placed within areas of of people, you know, at risk and easy prey, then you know, investigate a little bit further. I always do at my kids' schools or, you know, wherever, wherever it is likely, it is likely that uh, people would be easy victims for a predator. Remember, a predator isn't looking for a hard time at all. They're not, they're not into the fight in any way whatsoever. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, I'm with you. Um, he's a fool and a fool can make all kinds of accusations and threats and you're okay. Mm -hmm. That's his whole role is fool. Look at all the goofy things he does. However, we now know that Scott, this fool, this clown is the sewer clown. This is not the clown we, we expected. That's all I got. Chase, yeah. what do you got? Yeah, just one behavior here. And it's the interviewer uh, with these nonstop suppressive gestures as he's making the making these questions and stuff is very suppressive. I wish I could say that with the gusto that Mark likes to say it into the mic, but <laughs> I can't. Uh, but the obsession and repetitive talking points about grassing, which I had to Google today, uh, is a huge worry for me. If I'm talking to this person and they're obsessed with continually repeating that they don't share secrets, 
that is a major deal. So I I would I would guess that all four of us would have the same analysis without hindsight. Uh maybe and just be a little kinder uh in in the video. That's all I got. Scott. I think the reason he doesn't want the secretary to come on, it's obvious. She knows it all. She knows everything. And I think one little slip up in there could like be the little thread that unwinds that undoes the whole code of the whole shirt or whatever. So I think that's why he didn't want her on there. And he was kind of aggressive about it, sort of putting her in her place. And she's not even there, but he knows she's watching. So I think that I think that's what's going on there. I don't think this guy's crazy at all, because I think he's most likely a psychopath. I hate to go ahead and say that. I can't tell because I never <laughs> talked to him and then nobody put him through the the test or anything. But boy, he sure looks and sounds like one. So that's all I got. One of those tape replays. But well, you've had the kind of job that's allowed you to make a lot of money. As you say, it's given you the time to raise a lot of money for other people as well. And it's made you your own man. You, you like being in control of things and you like being in control of people. For example, why wouldn't you let your secretary of 25 years uh, speak to us and come on the program? Because secretaries spend their time secretarying and not grassing on their bosses. She knows where the secrets are. Oh, no, right? no, no, she knows nothing. She's well, lovely, she's lovely. She's a little bit scared of you, is she not? A I mean, little bit, I should hope she's a lot. But she was a, a lot because bit. when This Is Your Life was uh, doing you, and yeah. you know, that's a surprise, to be a surprise, she was so scared that uh, you would be angry that she hadn't tipped you off, that she did tip you off, that you were going to appear. Everybody tipped me off about everything. Yeah, and about. Nobody wants to die young. So you do want to be in control to no, the extent of being a I'm control just, no, freak. No, I like things. to know what's going on. Everybody wants to know what's going on in life. But what you see, you know? always say what you see is what you get. You've got nothing to hide. Don't look for any scandal. There right. is none. Right. Here I am. Yeah. So when she pops up in this screen in a minute, will you fire her? Yes. <laughs> well, she's still got her job because she's not coming up in this right. screen. <laughs> You feel that people in power, as I understand it, value your opinions. You like to be involved at the highest level oh. in this society behind the scenes. We spoke to Bunny Lewis. Oh. He told us this. I would say that he's very popular with them, certainly with Charles, and I think also with Diana. I'm, um, I couldn't go in any length on that because um, it would be indiscreet on my part. I don't think it's what he sees himself, it's what they see him as. And um, I think that they uh, have in the past um, considered and accepted his advice very seriously and indeed benefited from it. Because I think that he has tried very hard to make, make them more human. So, did Jim try to fix it for Charles and Diana? No. Of course not. Why is it that little sly smile on your face? No sly smile, it's just that... What am I, grass? I don't grass on nobody. I don't tell things. Uh, there are certain things which are no-go areas. Didn't work in the end, though, did it? Mmm, yeah. Next minute, I'll tell you all his secrets. <laughs> <laughs> Then he'll say, well, that's been a nice program, isn't it? Goodbye. No, you can have all the time in the world to tell <laughs> my secrets, Jimmy, if you give us the full story of how mm. you were consulted by Charles and yeah. Diana and spoke to them and tried to save the marriage. Now, which is what you did, isn't it? Unfortunately, that is what is called a no-go area, which is a very famous phrase of mine. We got all the papers, all had to go at me over the years, and I say, I'm sorry, it's a no-go area. And on the other end of the telephone, they say, ha-ha, you said you'd... They say that, and I say, that's right. It's a no-go area, and I don't grasp on nobody, neither the ladies in my life, or people that I've helped in my life, or whatever. But I'm quite prepared to talk about things, as long as it's not grassing on anybody. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so you have to know when he's making reference, and since I'm going first, I'll say he had a show called Jim Fix It where he would take problems and solve them for people. And what they're asking him about here is, did he intervene in Charles and Diana's marriage? 
really interesting because when they first starts off, he's got feigned disbelief in his face, but it's too quick. You guys talk about all the time that disbelief should stay for a split second, not disappear immediately. So clearly he was involved. And then you see that chin elevated and that slight smile. We, I, we typically associate that with pride. And then there's an intentional duper's delight, intentional, and an elongated no. And then he's go goes right back to his mantra. Same thing that Chase just said is that no grassing piece. So, yeah, he was involved. And I think since then it's come out that he actually did go and get involved with Prince Charles, now King Charles, uh, when he was still with Diana. Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, it, it's 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 um, it's true that he did was involved in that. Uh, it's true that there was a BBC cover-up around all of this. That's factual. Uh, it's factual that he was um, called in to talk to uh, now King Charles. Um, it's factual that he spent Christmas, I believe, at Chequers with the Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher. So here is somebody who managed to insert himself at the very heights of the English establishment. I mean, quite a feat for uh, a working-class um, minor from uh, from Leeds area, so um, so you know it would be an extraordinary, you know, brilliant story if it hadn't turned out that he was Britain's uh, most prolific serial abuser. Uh, he keeps falling throughout uh, throughout this. Uh, just keeps the mockery up and also does almost a reverse takeover of of uh, Andrew Neil here by saying, I'll tell your secrets. And again, this is his bullying tactic. It was always his tactic that he had people in high places. He had the police. He had, um, you know, he had politicians. He could call in favours. Uh, and it may well have been true because this was all kept quiet and and uh you know as we've said before it is very hard to keep secrets it's harder than you might might imagine even you know very very important state secrets it's very hard to keep them now a lot of those secrets are utterly banal and nobody even really wants to know and those are the easy ones to keep because like nobody wants to know but here's a secret that that certainly the newspapers would have absolutely run with uh, unless uh, they had maybe even D notices on them. I'm not, not quite sure. Um, but he does give the impression, that big open body language, that he is untouchable. And he would even say that, I'm untouchable. Uh, he did have, uh, well, it would be grandiose if it wasn't true. And I think it was true that he was untouchable until his after his death, and then and then he became touchable. Uh, look, underneath all of this grandiose nature, there is some dancing going on. He is under threat and pressure here in a way that he isn't in any other interview that you'll ever see him in. This is the only interview where he's really put under any kind of scrutiny because normally you just give Jim the stage and he does his thing and the British audience are bemused, delighted, uh, confused, um, uh, entertained by him. Uh, Chase, what you got on this one? Scott, what do you got? Oh, thank you. Uh, pretty much the same thing you do. <laughs> it's a continuation of what we've seen so far. It, there's there's not a lot you can add to this. I can sit here and talk about how he looks like a psychopath and all that. But to save us on time, I'll just say, uh, you know, same old, same old. One of those tape replays. <laughs> Well, she's still got her job because she's not coming up in the <laughs> screen. You feel that people in power, as I understand it, value your opinions. You like to be involved at the highest level oh. in this society behind the scenes. We spoke to Bunny Lewis. Oh. He told us this. I would say that he's very popular with them, certainly with Charles, and I think also with Diana. I'm, um, I couldn't go in any length on that because um, it would be indiscreet on my part. I don't think it's what he sees himself, it's what they see him as. And um, I think that they uh, have in the past um, considered and accepted his advice very seriously and indeed benefited from it, because I think that he has tried very hard to make, make them more human. 
So, did Jim try to fix it for Charles and Diana? No. Of course not. Why is it that little sly smile on your face? No sly smile, it's just that... What am I, grass? I don't grass on nobody. I don't tell things. Uh, there are certain things which are no-go areas. Didn't work in the end, though, did it? Mm, yeah. Next minute, I'll tell you all his secrets. <laughs> and then he'll say, well, that's been a nice program, isn't it? Goodbye. No, you can have all the time in the world to tell <laughs> my secrets, Jimmy, if you give us the full story of how mm. you were consulted by Charles and yeah. Diana and spoke to them and tried to save the marriage. Now, which is what you did, isn't it? Unfortunately, that is what is called a no-go area, which is a very famous phrase of mine. We get all the papers, all that go at me over the years, and I say, I'm sorry, it's a no-go area. And on the other end of the telephone, they say, ha-ha, you said you didn't say that. And I say, that's right. It's a no-go area, and I don't grasp on nobody. Neither the ladies in my life, or people that I've helped in my life, or whatever. But I'm quite prepared to talk about things, as long as it's not grassing on anybody. All right, Mark, what do you think we've seen at this point? Yeah, look, uh, hindsight is interesting, and, and so it's an interesting interview knowing what we now know. People most likely knew at the time. It's fact that there was a BBC cover-up. So if you're looking at this and seeing at, at one point one of your favourite entertainers, don't don't feel, you know, he was one of my favourite impersonations to do, as was Rolf Harris. You know, anybody who did impersonations would do a great Savile and a great Harris you know, they were they were two stocks that you had to be able to to do to do be at any level of impersonation, you know, or impressionist. So uh, so don't feel bad uh, about it if uh, or or duped because he had everybody and he man he was um, if anything you know a a genius at being able to dupe a um, you know if it's the right word to use probably not you know uh, a, a a genius at hiding in plain sight. Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, I'm just going to go through a behavior profile that uh, I'll leave what that means to Scott at the end. So we have grandiose sense of self-worth. We've got manipulative, deceptive behavior. We've got a lack of empathy and remorse. We've got predatory behavior. We've got exploitative behavior. We have compulsive and I think pervasive patterns of offending here and, and disobeying laws and stuff like that. Uh, and just a larger than life guy who duped a nation and was, like Mark said, hiding in plain sight. Greg? Yeah, I don't think he just immediately hid in plain sight. He started. And to Mark's point, he was a working class person who worked his way up. Well, there's a certain amount of, you know, local boy does well. This is all archetypal. I mean, you get an archetype wedged in your head. You don't assume that archetype is also the Antichrist. You just don't. So what he's done is simply wedged himself into real estate in everyone's head. So you don't look, you turn a blind eye. Even if he does something weird, you're turning a blind eye. To Mark's point, eccentric, eccentric actors. We have a few of those in the U.S. Maybe not quite as eccentric as this guy, or we just don't know about them. But he's hiding in plain sight because you've turned a blind eye and you've put a costume on this guy to turn him into what you think he is. Scott, what are you seeing? He's a great example of watching a, a psychopath at work. And I, it's easy for me to say he's a psychopath because what he <laughs> behaved, I don't know. He, nobody knows because we didn't get a look at his brain. But it sure appears to be from uh, the, if you went down the checklist, which obviously Chase's did, or part of it anyway, he's got all the, the red flags go up to say this guy is most likely um, a psychopath. I see, I feel so weird saying that, claiming the guy is when I don't know. We don't know, but outside, if I had to put my money on it, that that's what I'd do. If it was a bet, I'd go, okay, Greg, I bet you forty bucks, and I think I'd win the forty. I, bucks. I would probably say I'll, I'll hold on to my money because he did some pretty odd things. He did some weird stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty out there. Oh, oh wait, Mark, let's see the uh, imitation of Jimmy Savile. No, it'll never see the light of day again. I'm afraid. You show sure. your ass cheeks on television, but not a not the imitation. No more Savile. Okay. No more Savile That's for the cameras. You don't want to be associated. Not camera, I will, but uh, not not for the not for the public. Okay. Not for the public anymore. As as is Rolf Harris. It's sad, but there we go. 
But we have All to end right, the cool. show because so we can listen to this. <laughs> yes, and I won't record. We'll it. tell you how it was, guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks for another good, fellas, and we'll see you next time. So what do you got?